Uh, today we're going to talk about uh, uh, 3D technologies and uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, um, from my point of view is kind of a match made in heaven. Um, I've been discussing for many, many years uh, the fact that technologies per se taken in silo, single technologies per se taken in silo do not create great impact in terms of value and innovation for the companies. And it's important to keep uh, um, the, the scope broad and to understand where data can bring real value to the enterprise uh, in order to drive uh, real innovation and real value for the companies. Um, in my book that has been published uh, by uh, Wiley, Understanding the Metaverse, a Business and Ethical Guide, I have a full chapter on uh, how AI is gonna be fundamental for the creation of the infrastructure of the metaverse, which is the internet of the future that uh, um, we are uh, seeing arriving in the next 10 to 15 years. And uh, today I have the pleasure of uh, being surrounded by an incredible bunch of luminaries and friends uh, to discuss about the topic. Uh, people I had the pleasure to uh, work with in the last few years, uh, people I had the pleasure of knowing for the last few years. Um, I would like to uh, spend up like the first like three minutes just to allow them to introduce themselves. Uh, Julia, you already introduced me. Now um, I, I lead the technology-driven innovation processes within uh, the Accenture strategy and consulting practice in the innovation team. Uh, I'm also the co-lead of the Generative AI Studio that uh, uh, Accenture, the Global Generative AI Studio for Consumer Goods and Retail that Accenture opened in, uh, in Milan. Uh, and I'm here today uh, with, uh, um, as I said, some friends to cover all the topic of uh, 3D and uh, AI in the processes of digital transformation. Now, without further ado, I wanted to allow some of the uh, panelists to introduce themselves. Um, I think that we can start with ladies first. Uh, Joanna, would you like to start introducing yourself quickly? <laughs> yeah, thank you, Nick. Um, so my name is Joanna Webb. Um, I joined Accenture about a year ago from Microsoft. Uh, I've got about, uh, I work in the innovation technology group. Um, I've got about eight years experience of working with uh, virtual and augmented reality for training and education. And now over the last year, I've been looking at how can we bring AI into that mix and uh, create better, more effective training using uh, 3D, uh, 3D uh, design and uh, virtual reality and AI together. Wonderful. Thank you. Alessia. Hello, everybody. Hi, Nick. Thanks uh, for inviting me for this webinar. Um, my name is Alessia. I'm located in Helsinki in Finland. I've worked at Accenture for almost six years soon. I work as an experience and service designer in our MCBG group. It's Metaverse Continuum Business Group. So I work mostly with immersive technologies and other emerging technologies. And my job is usually to create different user experiences utilizing these technologies around solutions for different industries. So I'm very excited always to talk about, um, yeah, 3D, about UX in virtual reality and these types of topics. And my one of the biggest passions is probably combining technology and fashion and, and retail. So I, I do lots of stuff also outside work related to that. So, for example, I co-founded a conference about immersive technologies and fashion, as well as I do fashion illustration, virtual reality. So, yeah, these are kind of like my areas of expertise. Thanks, Nick. Wonderful. Th thank you, Alessia. Uh, Vlad, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Nick. So, yeah, my name is Vlad. My professional background is in engineering, software development, and AI. And my current focus area is on how we call it industrial generative AI. So, we're helping companies to bring the topic of generative AI, which is emerging and quite new, but on a robust and scalable way into the processes like engineering, product development, manufacturing, and supply chain. And uh, yeah, our goal is basically to help our customers to improve and in some areas even to reinvent the way how they design, develop, and produce their products. So I'm really happy to be part of this panel today. Thank you so much, Vlad. And last but not least, the only non Centurion on this call, uh, my friend Silvio. Uh, Silvio, would you like to introduce yourself, please? 
Hello, everyone, and thank you, Nick, for inviting me today. I'm Silvio Purvo. I'm the Chief Technology Officer of Optimal Cities. Since 2012, I've been dedicated to develop smart city plans and technologies powered by artificial intelligence, 3D and satellite intelligence. Uh, currently, I'm working with authorities, planners, and space agencies to create and implement technologies that can make cities healthier on Earth and beyond. Thank you. That's wonderful. So I think that uh, we have a very multi-phased team of talents here, um, and uh, um, I would like the conversation to be as organic as possible. But before we start into a uh, general discussion, I wanted to ask to each of you some specific questions about the impact of the technologies in question that uh, we are covering during this webinar. Uh, I think that we can start again from uh, the way that we uh, we, we introduce uh, we introduce us. So I would say that uh, we can start from Joanna. Um, I wanted to ask you, Joanna, um, how is generative AI transforming the landscape of learning and training in organization? You've been working quite a lot with clients and organization in the last few years in uh, using innovative technologies to improve productivity, learning, and education, but, and and and. I know we've been working a lot also together in some of those engagements and we know I know that 3D technologies played a big role when it comes to immersiveness and memory retention and so on. But now we have this new layer of AI and generative AI, large language models and uh, uh, data driven content generation. How this new technology is impacting the, the new ways of learning and training in the organization from your point of view? Yeah, Nick, I mean, it's a very exciting space right now. I think we're just at the very beginning of how it's going to be transformed by this technology. So, you know, I think we're, we're just at the starting point and, you know, it's going to expand rapidly over the next couple of years. But where I am now, I really see um, sort of six key areas where, where this technology is affecting the learning within an organisation. So, uh, one is around talent, how you think about recruiting people, the type of people that you recruit in your learning team, uh, how you retain those people. Um, linked to that, you've also got uh, augmentation of skills. So, you know, we're going to see that people who have traditionally maybe had lower skill roles within the learning of an organisation will be able to use AI to upskill themselves and to augment their day-to-day -day work. So I think we'll see, you know, certainly a shift in the way that we perceive people's skill levels. Um, uh, on top of that, one of the biggest areas I think is going to be a huge explosion of content. It's just going to be much, much easier to access learning content and to change that learning content between different media. So if something is quite a long document that you need people in your organization to absorb, you can then um, now you know, change that into a podcast or eventually into a video so that you can make use of the AI in that way. Uh, alongside that, we've got a question of trust and control. So you know, if everyone can suddenly transform their learning, change things into learning for themselves, can take new sources of information, we need to think about the trust and the control around that since that's gonna to start to be a key function of uh, the learning team within an organization. But I think the most important of all really is around um, creating the type of learning that we'll be able to create, you know, bringing together the convergence of the technologies of VR and AI to create simulations for learning, because I think that will lead to increasingly a more personalized approach to how people learn and be able to really create learning simulations for people that, that focus exactly on what their need is, whether that's soft skills or more technical skills. So I think those are the, the main areas where I see this, this impact uh, starting to affect businesses now. And this is super important because basically until now, all the training and simulation have been done in a sort of a cookie cutter way. So the same training for everybody. So this kind of technology, the bottom line of the impact of this kind of technology is that right now you can seriously start tailor made the kind of learning curriculum and methodologies to the capabilities and the capacity of the person that is uh, doing the training itself. So you can have some sort of uh, 
personalized one-to-one coaching and training for the enterprise uh, that can follow the person step by step and growing with the person and learning more about the person that is training the more that interacts with the persons is correct yeah and i think we know that the more personalized learning is the more effective it is and actually allowing learners also to have some control will also help them to absorb that learning better once they feel they have that control so being able to create for themselves scenarios or being able to have more personalized sources of learning is going to make a great difference to the effectiveness of the training going forwards. Wonderful. And, and, and could you provide some example of where synthetic and generative AI uh, have already enhanced the training effectiveness in some of the companies or maybe in some of the deliveries that you've done or some other examples that you've seen in the industry? Yeah, like I said, I think we are really at the beginning of this now and, um, you know, where we saw, for example, just a couple of weeks ago, this open AI video generation, you know, it's coming, but we're not at a situation already where companies are able to, you know, have already rolled this out yet. So we're just at the beginning. We've got a lot of companies who work in the um, VR space who are starting to integrate AI into their products. So Tailspin, for example, who work with Accenture uh, in soft skills, VR training, they, they're starting to bring in AI so that you can have a real live interaction within the training uh, to test your soft skills. Uh, Engage also have created a virtual AI assistant that you can interact with when you're in the VR uh, environment that they've created. Uh, and, uh, for example, Scoot Airlines have implemented a, a VR based training with integrated AI again to help really personalize and focus down that training on the on the um, on the particular area that's relevant for those employees. But I think generally we haven't yet got to the point where we've got a lot of statistics around how effective it is. Um, we have got some early statistics from Microsoft Copilot, where obviously a lot of companies have started integrating that into their day to day workflow. And we know that their people have fed back that they feel their 70 percent, 70 percent of the users feel they're more productive. 68 percent said it improved the quality of their work and that they were overall 29 percent faster. Um, I've actually got access to Copilot myself, and I would say it's definitely saving me a couple of hours a day in terms of the general admin work that also is part of learning and learning design as well. So, um, you know, and then I think if we go back to the 3D side, we already know that using VR for training, you know, is is faster and more effective than than doing just normal standard trainee learning or training of that type. So. I think you know we've got the we've got the foundation of this information, and over the next you know even six months, I think we'll start to see more and more information coming forward about how this how it, how it can save time or money or be more effective. Wonderful, uh, thank you, Joanna. I think that now we can move to the to the next topic, which uh, is also fascinating because uh, we explore the enterprise side of impact generative AI and, and 3D technologies, the immersiveness and, and the connection and the interaction, the natural interaction with the machine. And I think that's now with uh, what I want to do with Alessia is a conversation more about the impact on commerce and consumer um, uh, touch points, um, which is also very close to what we are doing every day in the Innovation Center that I'm leading for Accenture in Milan. Um, Alessia, what are for you uh, the, 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 the key ways in which virtual shopping experiences plus AI uh, can, can really transform the way that customers are, are buying products, experiencing products, and experiencing shopping? Thanks, Nick. Well, um, this is a really good question. Um, I want to highlight something you said in your intro. Before or a while back, people still looked at the technologies in a siloed way, right? We're talking about AI, yep. we're talking about immersive tech. And I think one of the coolest trends happening right now, people are starting to understand that, for example, Metaverse is going to be built utilizing very many different technologies. We're talking digital twins, we're talking cloud computing, 5G, XR, AI. There is misconception that virtual reality is in the Metaverse, right? But it, immersive technologies are just like uh, how it's going to be how it's going to be possible to make metaverse or our evolution of internet 3d so 
to come back to your to your question, you're asking virtual shopping experiences and how can we uh, enhance them with Gen AI. So virtual shopping experiences utilizing immersive technology, for example, can be uh, virtual try on experiences, right? Virtual showrooms, opportunity to visit a brand metaverse, these types of experiences. So for a consumer, it's it's a lot of uh, interaction with either with a product or with a brand. So if we look at the use cases now, the majority of Gen AI in retail and, and fashion cases are usually like right now at the moment, you know, it's experimenting stage. It's writing marketing copy or utilizing in design and product development or creating marketing visual content. So the trend is going to be to bring more of those closer to the end user. So I'm going to give you a practical example. You have a 3D garment from fashion or resale, right? But how it's going to look like on digital twin of your body? You want to know how it's going to fit. You want to you want to see the styling. You want to understand is it going to be a good product for you? So then we come to this really interesting point: how you can utilize AI, for example, to simulate cloth movement, right? How it's going to fit on your body or uh, maybe animate your digital twin to make it walk so you'll see it from the side. So these kind of very technical examples uh, of how AI can merge together with uh, extended reality to bring better customer experiences. But one really important aspect is also um, conversational AI, right? We see lots of people talking to ChatGPT, asking all sorts of questions and formulating a discussion and a dialogue. And now lies this really interesting opportunities to make customer experience with this kind of conversational, personalized understanding of the content. I mean, all of us at some point, right, got frustrated when you're looking something online and you your recommendations that come from the website are usually really bad or the recommendations come and say, you know, Others who have used this product have also seen this, and it's like no content or no relation to your interest search whatsoever. But if you're able to create this kind of a customer experience with Gen AI in a conversational and context remembering form to understand what kind of a buying behavior do you have or what kind of needs you have, and you combine that to other technologies, some, something like, for example, synthetic beings in a virtual environment, this is the future kind of vision that gets me really excited about, you know, having a personalized experience in 3D, in virtual reality, in a showroom where you combine all of these technologies and you get provided really good recommendations with Gen AI. And also for, for a company, you know, it's getting the statistics from these types of conversations and interactions and ability to bring re, to build re, really, really kind of strong brand connection. So, yeah, I, I see it as a way kind of like there are several aspects. It's visually what you can offer to the customer, but also what kind of content you can create with Gen AI and then embedded with immersive technologies. And, and I've seen some, uh, and thanks for this, you know, uh, overview, uh, Alessia, and I've seen some very exciting uh, possibilities with uh, um, generative AI and, and 3D. One of the things that I noticed the other day is uh, um, the fact that, uh, for example, you probably saw the the, advent, the announcement of Sora from OpenAI and the kind of incredible photorealistic features that Sora has. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, physics simulation, fluidodynamics, uh, but also coherence with 3D. Um, one of the very exciting uh, prospects is that in the future, it will be possible to to create material and photo shootings that will be animated directly with those uh, tools, uh, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in marketing material, promotional material, and advertising, for example, for fashion brands. That's every time they have to take do photo shootings for their products. Um, what are, from your point of view, the most exciting developments? For this industry, for consumer products, when it comes to generative AI, what's what 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 is it most excites you uh, in in the future of generative AI and, and what is coming uh, for for this kind of uh, industry? Yeah, so three um, D digital assets can provide value across the entire chain 
for a retail or fashion brand, right? We're starting from 3D digital product creation, sampling and prototyping. Uh, creative process itself, right, becomes much faster because you're able to visualize in 3D future products without, have, without having like physical waste. You can have real time revisions. And then you can move into, you know, showrooms launching where you have already kind of a library of your 3D assets and you create a virtual showroom where you can move these 3D assets. And then, like you said, content marketing, like you can create entire marketing complaint, uh, campaigns, sorry, uh, replacing photo shoots. You can have basically within hours synthetic environments, synthetic clothes, synthetic models. There are already digital mod, mod, uh, model agencies of models, right? Famous, famous digital twins that you can place for your brand inside a virtual environment and campaign. So, and then you move closer to the end user. There's, you know, opportunity to, for example, create much more responsive or immersive configurators for products, have more co kind of like co-creative tools to co-design a product together and then move into a model of on-demand creation. So you see how many people want to buy something, they co-create it in 3D, and then it can be ordered only later and produced on demand. So all these benefits of 3D pro digital product creation are known. However, what we see in the world right now is that there are very many obstacles to make this vision true, right? First of all, to create 3D assets, you need uh, programs like Clo 3 d Marvelous Designer, and it's really time consuming. So there is no uni kind of like universe, you know, uh, level that all fashion brands would be on the same stage right now with 3D digital product creation. Um, there's another, there's, there's lots of costs, it's hard to find, for example, when you create 3D assets, it's hard to find, for example, right textures and materials, what they're gonna look like. So there's lots of technical implications why what I described to you earlier, this value chain hasn't realized yet. Now, what we see with Gen AI coming to this 3D space is that, like you mentioned, Sora, we're gonna be able to democratize to some extent this 3D digital product creation. So we have all these tools, for example, like, um, uh, text to image, uh, or then, um, image to 3d kind of tools that are going to help you to create 3d models much faster. This means you can have your products or you can create virtual environments much faster. Right? So this is, I think this is going to be really exciting to try to get different brands to move into this perfect vision of, you know, having virtual showrooms displaying their product really well and have customer interaction. So I think this is a long answer, but I think getting there, what kind of projected benefits we already understand now, it's going to be more realistic and much cheaper and much faster for very many companies. So I think that alone is super exciting. And, and this is, uh, this is super interesting. I suppose that's, um, we started scratching the surface or more deeper use cases right now. I think that's probably generative AI. Uh, now the, the boom of generative AI happened about 18 months ago now, and uh, um, we are still very much so in the skeuomorphic phase of this new technology where we are trying to use the technology in order to accelerate, streamline, and uh, um, automate some of the processes that were done manually before while the very future the real future of this kind of technology is not just to automate the processes that are done right now more manually uh, by the, the user but completely transform the kind of processes that we are having right now in the different points of the value chain and this links quite well especially with the other topics that I wanted to cover with uh, uh, our friend Vlad from the Industry X practice. Uh, Vlad, I mean, uh, we've been using digital twins and 3D technologies in order to create synthetic data for uh, AI machine learning models for years. We've been using 3D data uh, in order to train um, the models that are then used for autonomous robots on the, the production line. Uh, but now there's this new game of generative AI that uh, comes into the industrial environment uh, and, 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 you know, is transforming in many ways uh, this kind of industry. 
uh, also from a point of view of potential synthetic training directly done using other generative uh, information. So generative AI that trains AI, which is also fascinating. Um, what are from your point of view, the most impactful and transformative use cases uh, when it comes to obviously digital twin and generative AI machine learning combined together for the industrial sector, Vlad? Yeah, thanks, Nick. So it's a great question and I will start with the point which you mentioned. So we had already digital twins or we had AI in the industry for many years. And the question, okay, at which state we currently are and why is generative AI such a big game changer in this space? And there are many opinions in this uh, area, so I'm very optimistic about the impact of generative AI for the industrial space. There's the different ways how we can describe this roadmap of complexity or maturity of AI in, in general in every industry. And we speak about detection, which are must like easiest way to uh, use AI, up to clustering, classification. Later we go further in the maturity to the prediction of processes and kind of a end of a crown of these processes are topics like optimization, generalization and creation. And there are some industries which before historically was much better and, and much further in this journey, um, especially in the areas like text generation and for, for example, marketing or financial data, where, for example, already for many years, a lot of content is being created or supported uh, with AI algorithms. And as you mentioned, in industrial space, this is not the case. And the, one of the major challenges is the diversity and the complexity of the data. So we had different uh, ways or different technologies which should help us to enable this transition. And the problem was really all the time this complexity of the data. And what we see now that generative AI is not only a game changer as a technology for us as a user. So we know ChatGPT and all these great applications, but also Generative AI at the moment in industrial space is kind of a new environmental uh, environment or setup or uh, kind of a middle layer, which enables many, many use cases, which are previously uh, was struggling in a setup. I can bring you three examples um, or maybe like three horizons in which we're currently going in the space um, regarding your question. So depart, depending on the, on the industry, we see at the moment, of course, a lot of industrial applications in the topics like knowledge management. And of course, this is the first thing which everyone comes up with. So we have ChatGPT, why I cannot just having something similar for my plant or for my uh, industrial application or for my machine, which produce any goods. And this is just a starting point and we see already huge benefits from this area. Um, for example, because speaking about like, goals in a project, uh, we all think we mean the same, but actually uh, we all coming from different domains and everyone have a bit another understanding of the topics like requirements, security, uh, also like topics like um, optimization. And what we see that especially large language models are capable of is this translation of our requirements or our expectation between different stakeholders and different different groups. So it's not only like used for usage for creation of texts, for example, but large language models and generative AI in general can help us to better understand our expectations from different stakeholders between each other as, as humans as well. And this is just the first starting point where we see a lot of usage already, like having this universal knowledge management system, which can help to exchange the knowledge and translate it between different domains. Uh, the next step what we currently see is a usage of generative AI as an intelligent assistant. And here we start this topic of uh, deeper deeper integration in the landscape in the customer side. So as uh, we know, speaking, for example, on about the trends on the market or retail, everyone currently is focused on the topics like connected products. So every product should be smart and connected. We all would like to have apps for everything. And you can imagine for Producing companies is a huge challenge in the complexity of the products. And also there, we see already many examples, which we also develop at the moment, with many of our partners together, how generative AI can help us to reduce this complexity or translate within this complexity with, between different requirements, support this whole process from requirements to the end product development. And here, this topic of 3D is extremely exciting. So as, as uh, 
also Alessia just mentioned, um, with iterations from new requirements to first draft of a product, is especially in physical products, is very long period. So if you have any changes, you have to go for all your departments, understand what does it mean for my product. And this leads, of course, to a very large time and time to market. So I cannot be so fast with my iteration as I would like to have to be. And also the process is very costly. And we see already there also that generative AI is a perfect middle layer just to accelerate this process and help to produce products which are more complex in a shorter period of time. And as a last third horizon, and we also see already in this area, uh, first partners of us who are starting to discover this area with us together is uh, this whole area of agent-based systems. So where we have uh, not only large language models, but uh, agent with dedicated tool sets, uh, which enable even deeper integration in different domains, like for example, 3D. So very exciting area in this space is a uh, whole topic of um, Omniverse for, as one of examples with NVIDIA, which already doing a great job of bringing metaverse experience, 3D objects, machine data, and AI together in one platform where we can collaborate in real time. Yep. And uh, exactly what you mentioned. So in many areas, we don't have enough training data to explain AI what we mean. And Omniverse already is showing us how AI can teach AI, or we can help AI to teach AI, creating environments for this AI to collect this data and also to simulate the processes. So these are three horizons where we see that depending on the industry, uh, yeah. the maturity differs, but the development is extremely exciting and not only from the cost perspective. So of course we can just have less spending or reduce costs of the development, but also this possibility to have much more personalized products in shorter period of time um, is just Amazing, and I see only Genii as one of the main accelerator of this development. Uh, can I? I wanted to ask you uh, another question before uh, we move on to to Silvio. Um, what do you see in terms of challenges uh, in the space of generative AI, three D, in terms of adoption in the industrial space? One of the things that, for example, um, I was, I, I've been doing a large transformation program with the, one of the largest automotive companies a um, few years ago. And we were talking since then, I'm talking about 2017. And since then, we were talking already about um, the digital asset pipeline or the digital assembly line. And uh, one of the main problems that we were having was uh, the, um, uh, distribution of information and uh, the protection of intellectual property when it comes to um, uh, industrial design and cut design. Uh, I don't know, I mean, for, for the people that don't know what I'm talking about, automotive companies are um, designing some of the main parts of the car and then they're purchasing or um, asking OEMs to design and produce other parts of the car, like for example, the infotainment system or the wheels of the car or the brakes of the car. All of those elements are provided by OEM producers that obviously uh, need to know how to attach those elements to the car, but they don't want to share those 3D information and schematics with uh, the automotive company because of course is their uh, proprietary IP. Uh, and, and there are obviously some problems related to the training of AI models and the usage of those AI models and 3D models across all the different points of the value chain that are seeing obviously as blockage uh, when it comes to the adoption across um, all the different points of the value chain in the industrial sector. Uh, what needs to happen from your point of view and what are, for example, technologies that are promising on that side, uh, for example, blockchain, or I don't know. Well, I wanted to have your point on this, uh, on, on, on this issue. Yeah, thanks. It's a great question. Uh, also with automotive being one of example of this complexity and, uh, you can Im imagine, um, exactly what you described. So you, the automotive company cannot just provide the whole blueprint of, of a car, for example, uh, to the OEM, uh, providers and suppliers. 
So we have to describe the all requirements in kind of one document. So what this one interface, one, one piece of a product should exactly do. And if it's not yep. acting as expected, the whole car will not work <laughs> on the end of the assembly. So um, we're speaking about on the end of millions of requirements, which somehow on the end should result in a functioning car. And this complexity you can imagine if you have a new stakeholder on your, or a new trend on the market. As, as a moment, for example, speaking about topics like uh, healthcare in a car, like tele telemedicine in a car, uh, personalized experience in the car. This is a huge new requirements which results actually in all parts of a car. So you would like to react with a lighting in the car, but maybe even having a different behavior of an AI assistant to, for example, uh, drive more aggressively or more, um, more calm, depending on, on your behavior as well. And all these new requirements are facing or targeting all components of the car. And this makes this process so complex because changing any yep. of these requirements will fall on huge costs and large period of time of adoption. And uh, what we definitely see, so uh, what needs to happen, um, the first part is that at the moment, many companies, including automotive, but actually the whole market, um, is uh, try to understand where to put the topic of generative AI. So is generative AI our IT topic? So is it like something like uh, uh, just a, another calculator? Is it just normal uh, AI like I had in quality inspection? Or is this topic more coming from, from verticals? So for example, if I have a company, automotive, and they're focused on quality inspection, should they have the authority of this topic and drive this topic because they're like main stakeholder? Uh, or it should be like a bottom-up approach and coming from the leadership, we have to bring and integrate AI and Gen AI everywhere. And we see that depending on the strategy, uh, the results are very different, how company can adopt uh, the process. And especially in the complex areas like automotive, it's extremely important to have a right strategy just not to have this isolated domains, uh, not being able to share this technology between each other. And as you mentioned, having this complexity with suppliers, uh, we had already many discussions with uh, several of our biggest mm -hmm. companies and partners saying that they definitely see also there being Genii kind of translator. So it's like deep trans will translate, but for suppliers where really can supplier can we can it, um, uh, react on changes of requirements. We can co-develop the product, and at some point, so not not today and not in one month, uh, but at some day, AI will be capable to have a, such a large context size and such a deep understanding of the product that it can actually also define these requirements and send to supplier. It can iterate over requirements and also understand the impact analysis. Like if I add another model to the car, what would it mean for my suppliers? And I think there's like two areas. So Companies, how to upskill their people and understand, okay, how to integrate this Gen AI topic in my governance. And the second area is technology. Um, the technology isn't a way to get this maturity to be able to help people to react quicker on changing requirements. Wonderful. And uh, uh, this brings us to our last guest, uh, Silvio. Uh, we've been discussing for many, many years about technology and science and AI. And uh, um, I know that we, we, we could talk about these things for like ages. And uh, we, we spent also afternoon and a, a very long podcast that we have done together uh, talking about the topic that uh, I, I suggest to everyone that is following this, uh, this webinar to go check out is also linked on my LinkedIn page. Um, but I wanted to, to get from you the latest and greatest from your side about the most transformative use cases that you're seeing in the usage of 3D assets and, and 3D design plus AI or and or generative AI and data in the things that you're doing, which is also very fascinating. I mean, for the, for the audience, we're talking about space economy and and planogram optimization for mars colonies and all stuff that is sounds super futuristic and sci-fi but is actual 
you know, material of work for a lot of people in our their everyday life like you. So, Silvio, can you give us a little bit of an overview of uh, what excites you the most right now uh, in the, 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 the task that you're doing in your everyday job that involves these kind of technologies? Absolutely. Thank you, Nick. That's an excellent question. Uh, I think to better understand the potential of AI and 3D, it's worth explaining urban planning process a bit. And for this, I use an analogy using terms from healthcare. So let's imagine that the city is a patient and we as urban planners are the doctors. So let's say city of Venice enters the doctor office. We need to analyze the city first, checking the history, doing some x-rays, taking samples, doing a visual analysis. And we do that right now with satellites, with a LIDAR, with our own uh, specialist eyes as well, but also gathering opinions from other uh, specialists and people. And after we do that analysis, we agree on what's wrong and what can improve then where. Create a treatment plan and monitor the effectiveness of that treatment the interventions uh, when applied in time and space. So, so far, we use 3D technology in the analysis phase and visualizing how it looks like right now and how it can look like in the future. And we'll, we'll look at the interplay between people, buildings, infrastructure, and the environment. However, now with artificial intelligence, we can go beyond that. We can use in the analysis phase to detect patterns, analyzing hundreds of different data sets. We use that to, to understand, for instance, what are the health factors influencing uh, people and the environment or also affecting the infrastructure. Uh, with generative AI, we can generate visions. Now it's very good for two-dimensional images, but it's also a generative 3D uh, gaining momentum. And I think that's a stepping stone in urban planning uh, as we need a five-dimensional planning system. This is something we envisioned back in 2014. So the transition to 3D to 5D planning system will mean that we're not only imagining the city at one point in time, but we imagine a city along multiple timelines that are running in parallel. So when something changes in a city, we can adapt to the scenarios and we can adapt the plans based on that. And that's specifically important in extreme environments. Also, interfacing aspects are important. So, so far we've seen many applications of generative AI, in text to text, text to image, now text to video and text to 3D. But what I find really fascinating is the emerging, um, is the emergence of brain to text. So if we are able at some point to replace text as an input and using our brain in symbiosis with AI to generate and visualize vision about the future within a 3D environment, we can have a more uh, collaborative, a much faster and a much more open uh, planning system that we can involve the visions, the ideas and the uh, knowledge of multiple uh, people. And there's a specific technologies we used before. I think Google Earth was evolved very well uh, from, from something that was used just for mapping to something that can now be integrated with other tools such as Unreal Engine. Uh, Black Shark AI is another good example. Uh, some of you that probably played uh, Microsoft Flight Simulator are aware of the entire planet being covered by Black Shark. And what it done was using a lot of data and imagery and model the cities and how they will, uh, they will look like. And um, those, those, those technologies are also made available because we have more streams or, of high resolution data sets. So with a bigger constellation of satellites and more LIDAR data, we'll be able to first understand better things that we cannot see with our open eyes. Uh, radar satellites, for instance, can penetrate clouds and see different types of materials. Um, LIDAR can have very high precision of uh, 3D information. And by having that data and using this as a training data for AI, we'll be able not only to understand how things are right now, but how things will evolve and how things can uh, be modeled and generated in the future. That's awesome. And, and from, from your perspective, uh, one of the things that um, is uh, uh, on your roadmap, uh, I know that you're working very much on uh, all things related to space economy and, mm -hmm. uh, and Mars colonization. Um, there are some major hurdles for us to move towards space. We're talking about finding resources, 
to um, finding a source of uh, energy, deploying eventual nuclear reactor on, on foreign planets and, and all this kind of uh, very you know, a uh, normal task for people on Earth, but humongous task for people on another planet. Um, what kind of role play um, the simulation of those tasks in 3D environments and eventually with the intelligent agent that are able to do permutation of solution for the task themselves and to, to, to create the best optimal output possible in what we call the space race. Um, can, you, can you articulate a little bit more how important this kind of process of simulating and trial and synthetic trial and error is in what you're doing uh, when it comes to, to space economy? Sure. So when I'm talking about uh, technology in general, I see it as an extension of our capabilities. So usually I categorize them in, in three major uh, categories, the capacity to analyze, uh, the capacity to, to think or create, um, and the capacity to act. Now, uh, in space, we have a major issue. Um, anything is in extreme environment. So, uh, we have extreme uh, factors that can affect our health and also the health of uh, the technology or assets there, robots, habitats, and so forth. But then we have also the issue of communications. The, the, the further away we're going from Earth, the, the harder is the communication. And on Mars, we have usually between 4 to 20 minutes delay because of relativity. So, uh, having a combination of both people and machines there is important because so far we had the rovers and they were fantastic in mapping terrain mm -hmm. and taking samples. However, they're not as fast uh, and they're not as, uh, let's say, effective um, from mm -hmm. a time perspective. So having the capacity to use AI and also a 3D simulation environments to train uh, those uh, machines, to train uh, different systems, uh, so they can respond better, they can analyze better, and they can do tasks and learn from tasks from people or learn from tasks uh, depending on the change of circumstances is important. I think one of the most important aspects in space economy will be having uh, robots or having machines that can um, do healthcare in space, for instance, because you in. in if you go beyond moon, it will be impossible to have real time surgery. So you will need uh, either a human doctor or um, a robot doctor that can perform that. And those are kind of high precision, high risk and very complex procedures and being able to simulate them. Uh, not in uh, kind of minutes or hours, but in decades or hundreds of years using uh, using digital technology. Uh, is very important. Also, simulating those extreme scenarios uh, is, is important. And with those technologies and that knowledge, then we can also apply that on Earth, um, as we can deploy uh, robots, we can deploy machines in environments where people cannot access, and you can uh, sort solve uh, emergencies at scale. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm, I mean, we we've been seeing a huge 10,000 miles overview of uh, the advantages of using 3D technologies plus AI for multiple industries. Uh, what I wanted to have from all of you, it's, uh, and eventually you can build on each other answers. It's, uh, it's, 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 a, you know, a, a, an overview of what are the strategic steps from your point of view in order to adopt these technologies in an effective way within the enterprise. We've seen a lot of companies, at least I'm talking about my, my, my point of view, a lot of companies that are approaching the transformation process in a very tactical way. So they started using ChatGPT across all the different points of the value chain. They let a thousand flowers bloom, as we say in the, in the lingo of innovation. But at the end of the day, we don't see um, um, in those operations that are in, in those initiatives that are very tactical, a true value for the enterprise. It seems that the value is more on a more strategic approach. 
Um, can you share your view on what are the best strategies and the best approaches in order to um, implement these kind of transformation processes to embed the 3D and AI within the enterprise? Maybe we can start with uh, with the Vlad. Vlad, do, do you have a point of view on this? Yeah, sure. So uh, I already started to describe a bit of uh, the complexity in, in industrial um, space, also because we have so many disciplines working together. So you cannot really deploy anything uh, in a scalable way if you're not speaking and thinking about topics like security, uh, how to scale it later, upskill your people, how to bring it really to the processes on shop floor. So it's a lot of topics which are really interconnected with each other. And I absolutely agree with your point. So looking back, like it now already over one year of the process of implementation of generative AI in different domains, what we see that this first strategy of creating of hundreds of use cases uh, is getting less and less efficient. Um, so I've, there's a famous quote like, idea worth nothing, execution is a king, kind of, kind of in this direction, that it's not about having a great use case only. You really have to have a strategy within your company and also a roadmap um, because this use cases and the landscape is changing very quickly. So yeah. we never did, so at least I was not even imagining that we'll have something like Sora uh, two, three weeks ago. I was sure that maybe we'll see something like this from a quality maybe in a year or two years or, or three years, even if I'm pretty optimistic in, in this area. And because this technology is so disruptive, you cannot build up your whole strategy just based on the current tool sets which you, you currently yeah. have in your company and uh, trying to grow around the small use cases and develop your strategy from your use cases. So you need both. You of course need people who can experiment with technology, who create and apply this technology to their business needs and their um, their challenges, but you definitely need a company-wide strategy on AI and now for Gen AI as well. Wonderful. And uh, um, Alessia, what's your take on this? Um, we published a few years ago, do you remember there was a report on scaling AI? It was really good. Yeah. Do you remember that one? And yeah. I remember like uh, it had reasons why scaling AI fails. And it was something like um, experimentation in companies is very siloed. And then there is no buy-in or no proper investment. And yeah. it was also something like, um, yeah, not being able to uh, have like this determined intentional extraction of, of data and value out of data. So I think this yeah. still kind of applies uh, again, all, all over again, right? You have to have really good intention about what is it that you try to achieve, and you have to make sure that departments in your organization have cross, um, kind of like really good cross collaboration, and um, yeah, and th that it's not it's not kind of like siloed experimentation happening, but everybody feels a sense of belonging. I would say to this kind of a new, uh, new vision of you know becoming. Yep a gen AI driven or AI driven, and then have a really good mindset of, uh, uh, of kind of like trying to amplify skills and capabilities with AI and do that as a team. I think that could be a really good approach to have this kind of like cultural change within the organization because the organizations are right made out of people and they're going to succeed as much as people want to succeed. So I would kind of, yeah, having strategic, uh, strategic management background, I would kind of think like focusing it on people training and building this community for constant innovation. But yes, I mean, there are issues, you know, with scaling AI or with uh, scaling innovations, and they are usually, you know, typicals like with any other kind of industry as well, not only for AI, right? Related. So, yeah, having a kind of like driving intentional AI, making sure it's a team sport, that's kind of my opinion what's what's your take uh, um joanna there's a, there's also a, a big topic that is related to data uh, a lot of people are talking about data being the most important discriminants in any transformational process when it comes to generative ai and uh, and the enterprise yeah i mean i think um you know having that clear data and having clean data you know is the foundation for any kind of ai 
project and that's been the same you know even before we've got into this generative ai period um certainly where i've seen you know client projects struggle that's because they haven't got that data they don't know their own data they don't understand where that data is so that's a very important part of before you even start you know pulling all of that together and understanding is it the right data set that you want to use for the training for training your model because otherwise you're going to get the wrong answers come out so i think that that part is really really important but i'd also like to build on what alicia said that you know i think it's important for companies really to focus on the change management piece a lot of the time and it's the same with every technology it was the same you know five six years ago with vr and ar you know people get get excited by the technology and they want to focus on the technology and buying the technology and they don't you know they don't put aside enough in the budget to really focus on how do we manage it within the organization how do we support people you know if you're bringing in a, an ai product into your organization you know if you want people to get the most out of it then you've got to support them at the beginning help them to understand how to use it because it's not straightforward you know it's not just like a chatbot that you type stuff into you know that's how it works but you know if you want to get the most out of it you have to think how you how you manage your prompts and all of the rest of it how you design your prompts and help people to understand that side of it so i think there are a lot of different areas to take into account and it's not just around the technology and the data but there are other factors as well and uh silvio we don't have much time we have a couple of minutes would you like to give us some closure uh, words about your take on how to effectively embed these technologies into, into transformation programs and how to take the most out of it Yes, I, I think I, I like the idea of symbiotic intelligence. So trying to complement what us humans cannot do or cannot do very well. Um, so one one way to approach this is making sure that technology, as if it's adopted, is trusted by the stakeholders involved, by the decision makers, and also by customers and end users. And the way I adopted technologies before, and I pushed for the adoption of technology was making sure that the outputs or the services that are generated are uh, much faster. So it's a metric uh, that can be much faster, much cheaper, or better, better quality. And usually they can come in as an extra bonus to what is usually delivered. And in time, they can see that extra bonus is actually the thing they want. So I think that's quite important to be trusted and also uh, measurably better. Wonderful. And I think that so we uh, closed uh, with uh, this our webinar. Thank you so much to all the panelists uh, that uh, joined me today for this uh, interesting conversation. Thank you to Ikan and Julia for organizing uh, this webinar, and thanks for everybody that joined and listened to our conversation today. Uh, Julia, I'll leave you the final words. We got one minute. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you too to uh, all of you to share uh, with us your experiences and uh, your uh, your point of view your uh, your know-how it's uh, really really important for uh, for us uh, grazie nick a te in particolare per il coinvolgimento e come detto tu a tutti i nostri um, partecipanti